Yeah, thank you, Ter <coughs> Terry, and ladies and gentlemen. Um, I have to say, although I've worked, uh, had the fortunate uh, circumstance to work with many of you over the last decade and more, I still feel like the oddball in a forum like this. I listen to your scientific talks, and I, I sometimes wonder, am I in the right room? You know, should I be next door or something? But I do think uh, it's important for people like I to be in these forums, and. I think it's important for the points Terry made at the very beginning about governance, which I'll also talk a bit about. That successful governance depends on us understanding each other, no matter from which way you look at a problem. And I think it's equally important, of course, for the science community, as you are, to be engaged in the political processes and the decision-making processes generally. So I'm very pleased and thankful to be here. And I'll bring a slightly different perspective, I guess, but uh, much the same issues uh, repeat themselves from our perspective as well. As Terry said, my organization is an industry body. We're not a government body. We're funded by the industry, the tourism industry. Um, not to do marketing, that's other people who do this, we do everything but. We engage in strategic planning, we engage in a bit of research, we engage in industry education and the uh, incre increase of the capacity of our industry to be successful and competitive and profitable into the future. So I want to talk a little bit about, make a few observations about tourism and what it is and how it works very briefly uh, and also for the future our reef story, and then the partnerships for success that I think uh, we're all interested in. So tourism, what is it? Look, we're driven by our consumers. We make very few decisions about what we do. It's the consumers who decide that. They um, give us a bit of an idea of what they want to shop for, Hugh. They tell us where, which uh, shopping list they have, and we try to provide that. We have choices about which segment that we want to address, which segment of the shopping list we want to fill. And in Australia, we have a particular uh, set of intentions in that regard, but we're consumer driven, absolutely consumer driven. And it, it does loop back, that does loop back to, again, the governance. It loops into that system, and I hope that becomes more clear as I speak. Perceptions are reality for us. If uh, when Leonardo DiCaprio says the reef is not worth diving on, then that's reality. It's reality for us in, the, in, in terms of the decision-making process of people, where, of, of people about where they go and what they see and how they perceive it. It is very much reality and we have to deal with this every day. So we have to not only do the right thing, we have to be seen to do the right thing as well. Again, to meet the consumer choices. Increasingly, we know that our consumers, and you're all uh, consumers, I have never met a group that travels more than scientists, I have to say. I, every time I speak to any of you, they've just been to Belize or the Bahamas or somewhere, and I'm green with envy, and uh, it, it illustrates that uh, scientists also are uh, incredible travelers, and I'm sure you would fit into that observation very neatly. You're all after experiences when you travel privately, at least. It's inclusive experiences that touch your, your soul, touch your, your uh, expectations. For Australia, and uh, in terms of meeting consumer expectations, we're very much into natural attractions. That's what we're known for, whether it's the koala or the, the, uh, the other animals that we're so famous for. It is the natural attributes that uh, attract people to this country by and large. And when we ask people, why did you think you wanted to come to Australia, or why did you come to Australia, um, of all the uh, single things that we identify on these choice list, the lists, the Great Barrier Reef ranks at the top. Even people who never go to the reef when they're here, they still were partly motivated to come here because of its presence. It's an important aspect for us, and nature is, of course, what we do sell. Uh, you see very few advertisements uh, or, or promotional material that does not include some aspect of nature, particularly for Australia. It is what we sell. The Queensland government, um, uh, I'm sure you'd be pleased to know, uh, does actually understand this from a tourism point of view. This is a, a screen a shot from a website that the Queensland government maintains. It uh, details the tourism strategy that they have worked out with us, I have to say, because they identify tourism as one of the great drivers for the economy of Queensland. And uh, in that uh, framework, in that uh, uh, strategic plan that they have, the second theme, as a matter of fact, is uh, preserving our nature and culture. Now, you may take a cynical view of that, but uh, I'll, I'll have to think positively and say, look, the government at least understands from our industry's perspective how important our natural attributes are. So that's a positive for us. And uh, it, behind that simple statement is an entire strategy 
that uh, aims to uh, achieve this objective. So that's a good that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Specifically, I go back to our, our uh, assets, if you like, that we have for the tourism industry. This is a list of Australia's World Heritage uh, list, uh, 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 properties, the cultural, the natural, and the mixed ones. And when you look at this list and then you highlight the ones in yellow, when you highlight the yellow ones, uh, which are the top tourism attractions that we have. So these are some of the most visited places in Australia, happen to be pretty much uh, two thirds, if not more, of the list of World Heritage properties in this country. So it illustrates, again, how important the natural attributes are and also how important the World Heritage perception and uh, label and brand is for us. It works. People do attach value to that. And there are numerous studies from around the world on natural and cultural World Heritage sites and what it does to visitation. And there is sufficient evidence to suggest that the label, the brand of World Heritage does increase visitation, particularly to the natural uh, properties. Interestingly enough, more so than the, <coughs> than the cultural ones. So uh, for, for us, what, uh, what have we seen? How, we have we, how have we engaged with the Barrier Reef? The, the transition from seeing the reef as a resource that to be uh, mined or exploited only 50, 60 years ago when that was very much on the cards to treating it as an asset as we do uh, involved visitation from the very beginning. When the Barrier Reef, and I'm sure some of you know the history better than I do, but when the Barrier Reef first become, became a topic uh, or a, a subject of possible protection long before World Heritage status and long before the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, it was visitors, people who traveled north, who saw what they, what they loved and who, who, became, who came to appreciate it. And it was, a th if the history that I understand is correct, it was the threat of a farmer wanting to mine a dead reef to use as fertilizer that some visitors uh, were prompted into action to say, uh, well, that's not a good thing and we should do something about it. And uh, interestingly, interestingly enough, with a poet in coalition, they managed to uh, avert the worst fate for that particular reef and it subsequently led, of course, to the uh, protection more broadly. So it is important to, um, to understand that it is often people who, for emotive perhaps, but for all sorts of reasons, visit an area, love it, and then help that process, that governance process, Terry, of changing, changing the way we look at things and the way we do things. Users and protectors, we are users of the reef, but uh, I like to think uh, our industry in the main is very much uh, a, a protector now of, what, of this asset because it is an asset for us and is because we build our future, our commercial future on it. It means we have to have coalitions of common interest. We have to work together with all sorts of um, parts of the community and we have to make sure it is all parts of the community that uh, share in that process. And for us as a tourism industry, we cannot separate ourselves from the community, whether it's for environmental reasons or for social reasons. We cannot operate in an environment that's hostile to us. Uh, or when that is being attempted, it's very uh, unsuccessful around the world. So we have to make sure we have this true triple bottom line in our industry more than any other industry. We depend on that. It's not just an afterthought, you know, in the, the corporate documentation that you see of some companies and in other industries that have some sort of a social program at the end of it. For us, it's part of our business. We cannot separate us, ourselves from that. And I think we have a track record, particularly in the context of the reef, of achieving that. And some people already alluded to the the zoning and the inscriptions of the reef in the first place. So we have a good track record and I get back to that. It does, of course, become very important, as I said before, to the advertising, this is Tourism Australia, uh, using images and uh, making reference to uh, the natural attributes, so just put that in for entertainment, I suppose, but it's a very common uh, theme in our uh, promotion, particularly overseas. The visitation to the reef, I'm sure you've seen this graph before, that is the number of people who are with commercial operator visit the reef. It doesn't include recreational, fish, uh, recreational visitors in their own boats, but these are the numbers of those people who travel with a commercial tourism operator and as a consequence pay a fee to go and into, the, into the national, into the marine park. The numbers are a bit, uh, you know, uneven, I suppose. There's, there's been a bit of a decline. We're trying to redress that. We're trying to bring people back to the reef and we're trying to get the message across that it's not just something, even as a domestic visitor, you do once in your life. 
but it's something you can go and enjoy in different ways uh, continuously. And that's a very important aspect commercially for us, of course, to achieve that. We have, for instance, come up with, uh, with this grade eight uh, concept, you know, to give people the idea just seeing one thing isn't enough, you have to see the grade eight, and that's obviously leaning a little bit on the, the great animals of Africa where people are encouraged to go and see all of them. And what's, imp what's interesting about this, uh, this process, and this is sort of a website where this is being promoted, not ours, it's the, gov uh, the Queensland government's website. Um, but the process by which the grade A's were identified was actually very interesting. I don't know if any of you were involved, but it involved a lot of consultation, community consultation. This was not based of some, on somebody saying which are the best pictures. This was based on a discussion with the community, with the industry, in the regions along the barrier reef catchment uh, to find out what makes the reef you know what is it that is special to you about the reef and uh, you know out of this was distilled this list but more important than the list almost to me was the process by which everybody was challenged to think you know what was what are the values what is it that makes the reef special for you is it some spiritual connection you have to it and that, those kinds of processes and this is just an example of it are very very important i think to maintain the, uh, the, the connection that we have to this asset and our determination to protect it as a result. Also, just in terms of other campaigns that are running uh, based on the reef, the best job in the world, you heard about this campaign a few years ago. Uh, it was a person that was placed on the reef, on the reef island, to travel around and, and extol its virtues in the social media. It has been replicated last year, and uh, every state had a best job in the world on offer. Queensland, uh, fortunately, uh, advertised a job as the park ranger. You could be a park ranger for six months. And that person, a, French, a young French woman, uh, very much spent a lot of time talking about the reef, talking about its, its attributes, uh, tweeting it and, and putting it on social media. So we understand the reef as a, as a great asset that we can make work, and not just as a gimmick, but as a genuine uh, piece of connection that people can uh, uh, latch on to and engage with. And it's very, very important for us to, to continuously innovate that. We have the Eye on the Reef program run through Cabrumpa, where the industry is very much engaged in helping uh, the uh, data collection and, and management. And we have volunteering programs. I'm sure some of you have been involved in some tourism products where you actually pay in some cases, a lot of money uh, to uh, participate in some cleanup or in some monitoring or some data collection process, not just on the reef, but elsewhere as well. Now, all of this work that the tourism industry has done with Gabrumpa and has done with the management agencies and politically has actually been recognized uh, by, by the outcomes, but also been recognized in the mission report that uh, John talked about. And uh, I like using these quotes. There's a couple of quotes I want to use. I'll let, it, let you read it yourself. But I think it's a, it's a very important recognition from that perspective too, that tourism actually can, be, can play a very positive role in the process. It goes on to say somewhere else, and again, I'll let you read it. I'm sorry, it's two pages of this, but it's important. It goes on here. So this is all a good story, and it, it could be a, a story with a happy end, but as we've heard already this morning, uh, the story is coming a bit unstuck at the moment, and not just ours so much, but uh, the, the way this, uh, the, the whole governance of the reef is going is probably not consistent anymore with what led to these positive statements and what led to a very uh, good integration of our positive efforts with, with the overall outcome. I think we can use tourism uh, as a, the industry and we can participate much more successfully in, in achieving good outcomes uh, across all, all criteria. That is by increasing the existence value of the natural assets, by having more people who are more uh, stronger advocates uh, for this and, uh, and also increase the understanding, of course, through the integration of science into what we do and what we use in our communication and obviously increase the political value of the protection outcomes for the reef and other things. And Terry, you referred to the green zones and the zoning. I mean, if it, has, if it hadn't been for all the advocates who were able to energize the people who had been to the reef or may, have, may want to go to the reef or may want their children to go to the reef, if it hadn't been for 
act for the for the capacity for all of us to activate that support base. I don't think it ever would have happened. If, I, I just cannot imagine it. Um, and there was an important uh, uh, survey that the WWF did as part of that. Uh, struggle uh, just before the decision was made or sometime before the decision was made finally by a conservative government uh, where people on the north shore of sydney were surveyed to find out what is your opinion about this you know do you think the reef should be protected in this way now these are people as i said on the north shore of sydney a long way from uh, the reef itself and with no direct connection to the reef but it was the overwhelming overwhelming support from that survey as well that the wwf and us were able to present to the federal government that contributed. I'm not saying that made the only, it was the only thing that contributed to it, but it had an impact on the outcome. So it's very important to build that political capital from a tourism perspective. Look, that's just my little simplistic way of looking at it. You know, you have biodiversity, and I'm, I'll never use ecosystem services again after that talk before, you have biodiversity. Um, it leads to visitation, that's what people come to see, obviously, fundamentally. It generates economic returns for, for our industry and the community, I have to say this, for the community. And in fact, it was Ove and his economist uh, father who uh, produced the first report for us, must be 10 years ago, 12 years ago maybe, where, and even my members thought we were a bit crazy to, do, to invest money in this, but we had a, a report commission to ascertain what, what, the, what is the state and uh, what is the the value of the reef biologically, but also how does it contribute to the economic outcomes of our industry. And it was, now it's commonplace, it's hardly revolutionary, but then it was pretty out there for many people. We did this report and even then we were able to demonstrate that it was about $5 billion that were generated on the basis of tourism visitation to the reef and about 50,000 jobs were associated with it. Now, it's not just greedy tourism operators that say this, it's a community, a coastal community, it says we have 50,000 jobs that are based on the biodiversity here. It creates that value. It then leads to asset management. And I like using that term, it's asset management for us. It may not be, you know, sound nice, but it's asset management. That's a good thing. You know, you look after it. You make sure you can make those choices uh, that, that we need to, to, that Hugh is talking about, that we have a basis and the capacity to really, with focus and determination, look at the way we manage those assets. So, uh, we need for the future, I think we need to really strengthen this cooperative approach that we have. We have, co we have to have cooperative management in the, in, the, in the reefs case, you know, the, the users, the people who are out there, the, the, the marine operators, they have to be a part of it as they, as they are, but we have to do more of this. Supportive site monitoring is going on with Gabrumpa very successfully. A lot more can be done. There are co-investment opportunities where uh, the tourism industry, the bigger ones, are willing to in, invest in things that are outside the normal business operation. And of course, we can uh, res, uh, support research, and we've done that uh, quite um, uh, uh, with great determination over the last decade or so. We've made big investments. We're part of the Reef and Rainforest Research Center, which replaced the uh, CRC reef and the CRC rainforest. So we, we actively, it was the tourism industry that set that up or helped set that up with federal money. With, we, if we have these well-managed partnerships with you, with us, with, uh, with, other, uh, with other parts of the community, we can, really, we can have better, more sustainable communities up and down the reef. We, we, we can live there in harmony and happily. I mean, I have this crazy hippie belief, you know, we can still do that, so, and I think we, we, we will be successful in doing this. We can make those ecosystems with the help of tourism more visible. It's the demonstration power of the reef to help people understand what an ecosystem is and how, how systems can work is incredibly important. People like looking at the pictures of the reef. You can explain things. Other things are maybe less exciting from a populist point of view to explain, but the reef is very powerful for that. We can explain that there are no externalities effectively to the average person who makes decisions about that. I think we have to use that far more successfully and we have to use the attention that people give us when they're on the reef or near the reef to listen to it. We have the most successful operations on the reef, tourism operations on the reef are those that have maybe a scientist present explaining stuff. It makes it exciting for people who are not scientists. You know, the majority of people are not scientists, they're not marine scientists, but they're still interested in this stuff. They want to hear it for somebody, and if they hear it, they go home and they vote for somebody who supports a good outcome. Um, that's just a simplistic way, but I think it does work like that. It can lead to better management, obviously. 
and better governance. And that, that is a separate thing, management and governance. And I think the last slide, oh yeah, put this, this is a happy snap, but I thought I'd put this up to show how coalitions and partnerships can work here. Obviously, you know, we have a comedian here and we have a scientist and I, and uh, when I thought to illustrate partnerships and it does sound like the beginning of a bad joke, but uh, you know, it was important for us in this case, I won't go into the details, but it was important for us to have somebody who had a public profile, somebody that people listened to, to be part of that story and the, the storytelling. We wanted to make a particular point, he was available, we used him, and it works. It works, these sorts of things, so it's not just trivial. So the, to be really successful, you know, we do have to, um, uh, we, we do have to address the fact that it's ecologically, socially, and economically a very, very complex system. It's very large, obviously. And we have to make sure that our governance, more than anything, is inclusive and comprehensive. And I loved the, the things that Terry said about governance. It's not just about a management system, you know, and lines in the political system. It is very much embedded in the overall community leadership, the way that this, these things come about. And we have to, uh, we as an industry, I believe, and you as a science community and in collaboration with everybody else, we have to be far more determined, far more focused on how we achieve that. All the successes that have been achieved for the Barrier Reef have been the outcome of those coalitions, these amorphous coalitions, this governance you know, by the community, all of them. We have to make sure that we use all these mechanics, this dynamic and the knowledge we've gained successfully to bring about a continue, uh, a continued success and more success because we are under threat. There's no doubt about it. The paradigms, the priorities have shifted for both state and federal governments. I don't think they do that to destroy the reef, but they, they have another way of looking at things. And we have to help them. We have to help them to broaden the horizon and see the picture as the community sees it and as we see it. So that's governance, that's where, we, where our responsibility is as an industry and you as a science community. So I think that wraps up what I wanted to say. Indeed, yes, thank you.